Hello everybody, and welcome to another one of those interview things I like to do. And, as always, we have a very special guest today. You may have heard of his work in animation, both western cartoons and anime, his extensive work in Muppetry, or puppetry, by which I mean he's got an extensive history in Muppet performing for the last three decades or so, live action work here and there, and if that wasn't scary enough, the man has won an Emmy. Yes, we... We have an Emmy winner in our presence today, so wish me luck as I get the utmost honor and pleasure of chatting with Mr. Tyler Bunch. Burp, 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 burp. <laughs> Greetings, Meeks. Really good to see you. Thank you for, thank you for agreeing to chat with me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like I say this with everybody that I speak with, but I really do mean it when I say thank you for lowering your standards enough to speak with me today. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for addressing the, the Muppet elephant in the room. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You've performed a couple of Muppet elephants, haven't you? Here and there, here and there. <laughs> <laughs> so, to start things off, I always ask this with everybody, but uh, what got you into the world of entertainment, and uh, what were some of your biggest inspirations? Good question. So, um, I grew up sort of a theater kid, almost by necessity. Uh, my father taught collegiate level theater. Wow. And um, if I wanted to spend any time with dad, it was usually at the workplace, which meant I was in my first uh, theatrical presentation at the age of three. Wow. <laughs> um, I was a child in the outdoor drama, the Great Smoky Mountain Passion Play. Um, and... Uh, the gentleman who played Jesus would pick me up in the middle of one of his sermons and place me on a donkey. The donkey <laughs> and I were good friends. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, so that was that was the beginning of basically a hobby in theater. Uh, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a zoologist. That was my deal. I, I liked animals. I liked commuting with animals. I liked studying animals. I liked learning all about them. And theater was just a pastime. But then in high school... I started realizing that my experience in summer camps and uh, whenever the college production that my dad was working on needed an actual kid in something, um, like the version of To Kill a Mockingbird when the little neighbor comes over and pours maple syrup all over th everything, <laughs> um, among other you know, theatrical endeavors, uh, I had the biggest leg up in the emotionally competitive arena of high school in theater class. Um, I did enjoy the science stuff, but I realized there were other people who had a much stronger ability and acumen for, for the math and the scientific properties. I, I still did pretty well, but where it felt like home was theater class. So I decided around the end of my junior year that I was going to pursue being a performer and Went to college to get the fallback degree, so to speak, but it was still in theater, which is kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> while in college, I fell into monitor puppetry, puppetry for film and TV, as sort of a hobby, literally just a thing on the weekends with some friends. Mm -hmm. And when I finally finished my collegiate career and moved to New York to pursue being an actor, what I thought was going to be on the musical theater stage... I also sent the tape of the things that I had done in puppetry to the Jim Henson Company. The, back then, you used to do literally a video cassette reel that you mailed. It was kind of expensive because you had to do lots of them, but <laughs> literally put by VHS in, in the mail and sent it to the main offices of Henson and went about my trying to be an actor thing. And, I, and I've done okay, like even better than some of my peers that I landed into the city with. Um, I was a resident company member of the New York Gilbert and Sullivan Players, which are a professional operatic company that toured the United States and have done some stuff internationally as well. And I performed most of the major baritone roles over about a 10-year period with them while I was dipping my toes in other things, improvisational performance, whatever camera work would come along as an actor. Um, but I eventually kind of pestered the Henson Company to look at my tape because they hadn't. <laughs> that got me invited to the Sesame Street just to spectate, and that got me like 12 days of work over my first three and a half, four years uh, with the Henson Company, 
simply when they needed a lot of people. I was just one of the guys in the background. Mm-hmm. And um, then my big break in the puppetry world came with the auditions for Bear in the Big Blue House. Uh-huh. And I was lucky enough to secure <laughs> a few roles in that. And um, the rest, as they say, is history just in terms of Careers are built on relationships, and, and when you find a group of people that you kind of jive well with, when they move on to projects, they either ask you to come along, come along or suggest you as, as an auditioning participant or whatever it is. And so I've been fortunate enough to bounce around and haven't really had a quote-unquote day job for about 25 years now. I've been lucky <laughs> enough to just be an artist all the way around. Well, that's good. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for uh, making your way through that extended monologue. That's okay. That's what Sorry, we're here for. Sorry, I didn't for. give you any room to breathe and <laughs> ask questions. But... No, no, it was really, it, I loved it. It was really intriguing. Like, your, your career has been pretty extensive and you've gotten to do a heck of a lot. Like, when I was doing research, I was like, okay, I already know a couple of things that uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Tyler Bunch has already done. And it's like, wait, he was here and he did this and he did this. And, oh, wow, <laughs> I'm getting a little scared now. <laughs> Who am I speaking to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't be intimidated. No, please. no, no. It's it's cool. You're you're cool. Uh, I, I love what you've done with the, the your beard too. That's that's really good stuff. Oh, like people at home can't see you, it, thank you. but I I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what what he's uh uh sort of admiring is I I keep a sort of a hillbilly length beard divided into two separate small chunks on either side of my chin that are then twirled up into these little cigar-shaped tubes on either side of my jowls. How, how hard is that to maintain? Like, what, what is that <laughs> What is it's, that like? Well, it's like um, anything else. If you, if you train your body to do enough things, it'll kind of do it on its own after a while. So uh-huh. um, <laughs> I've been doing this long enough that they kind of behave on their own. But if I need to help them out, I use a, a toothbrush and a, a big, thick straw and kind of make them get back into curly shape. No kidding. <laughs> On to the next question. I also wanted to know what got you interested in general voice acting and like just not just the war- performing with puppetry and stuff, but how did you get into uh, anime and Western animation? Was it, it was just a byproduct, I guess, of what you were just going on about earlier? To a certain degree, yeah. I mean, like anything else, you need to be prepared for when the doors open for you. And I've had several family members tell me that even as a kid, I used to always do silly voices and make sounds and do sound effects with my mouth. And uh, my mother even bought me um, this book, a literal hardcover book back when that was something people used to collect. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) Fred Newman, who some of you out there may know as the guy who does cool voices every once in a while for uh, Between the Lions. He's been on Sesame Street a couple of times. Uh, The Prairie Home Companion is a famous radio show that Fred does all the the foley for, all the sound effects for, usually with his body or mouth. He wrote a book on how to make certain mouth sounds. So my mother bought me that when I was a kid. And I learned how to do certain things like cricket whistle and some other things from that book. Um, So when the opportunities availed themselves to me because of the puppet world, because obviously you're creating all kinds of different characters with your vocal persona, as well as whatever you can do in terms of manipulating the puppet specifically. um, Opportunities around kids' properties would just kind of come up or what I was involved in. Like, for instance, Between the Lions, I was connected longer to that show doing voices for the animated pieces than I was as a puppeteer because in later seasons the cast kind of got ensmallened and so I was still brought on board to do some of the things for animation and eventually I also did some things for um, the reboot of the electric company but that uh, being part of that world had me at one point at a place that no longer exists called uh, Do Art Mm post-production in the city which are the company that used to do Pokemon, uh, the English dub of Pokemon. Yeah. And one of the producers there, slash directors, uh, Tom Whalen, said, would you ever be interested in, in you know, coming and playing on Pokemon? And I was like, sure, why not? He said, let's try you out. I'll audition you for a couple of things. And I was lucky enough that the producer said yes. Mm-hmm. So I've been in and out of the, the Pokemon realm um, and now 
part of the few of the New York cast because it's based basically out of California now mm -hmm. for the English dub that has been able to kind of tag along. And now uh, Lisa Ortiz, very talented voice performer and director, voice director in her own right, gets online with me every once in a while and we keep those characters on the English version alive, which is fun. Yeah. When, like when I heard that, because I mean, obviously I, I keep... I keep tabs on the Pokemon stuff, and then when I realized that it was going, like, uh, L.A., and then New York was also on the side, I was like, oh, man, well, I know that Lisa Ortiz is still at the helm, so I'm sure that she'll keep her friends on and make sure that everything is on the up and up with consistency, and lo and behold, I, I was so glad that I was right to see that, okay, everyone is still on board, there's a lot of L.A. guys in here, too, and blah, 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 but consistency I, I really like consistency it's okay this pokemon sounds like it should and all these characters are still voiced by these guys phew like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i'm saying for you, you should <laughs> it's like oh thank goodness <laughs> but uh let's because yeah um when it came to when i heard that you were in pokemon and i found out when i looked at your background and stuff there is uh, a comment on your page on uh, Behind the Voice Actors that pretty much encapsulates it and where they say, I have only known pain and suffering since I found out that Shrilo and Incineroar have the same voice actor. <laughs> and that's basically what went <laughs> yeah, through it my does, head. <laughs> it, it does. It even boggles my mind. Um, yeah. uh, very, again, I've been very, very fortunate and one of the most amazing parts about being able to be a voice actor and of course a Muppeteer is that you're lucky enough to perform characters that you as a living, breathing human being would never necessarily be able to inhabit. Yeah. And um, I'm probably closer in physical stature to Incineroar, but um, Trilo is still obviously very near and dear to my heart. So mm -hmm. lucky, lucky man. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, this was a question that came in uh, later, but I like to try and see how it flows if something just happens naturally. But how do you feel about the term Muppeteer? Because I've looked at some things and some uh, puppeteers for, that the Henson Company have been like, eh, I'm not crazy about that term. But uh, what do you think about it? Or what's your preferred term? I don't really have any strong feelings about it. Uh, for me, it's comparable to the notion that any sort of branded IP, if it can insinuate a certain amount of specificity in terms of what the artisans are bringing to everything, Muppeteer in and of itself kind of lets you know that the, the individuals involved have probably reached a certain level of acumen in everything that they're trying to do. So there's sort of an understanding that if you're called a Muppeteer, that means you've performed for the Muppets, and therefore you are probably, you know, of a certain performative level. Not that anybody should be judged in that sense, but when your effort as an artist is to keep moving forward and people talk about what have you done lately or what's your thing, if you can call yourself a Muppeteer, it is a shorthand that can be communicated easily of like, okay, this person has done blah. Yeah. So it doesn't bother me in that sense. What bothers me more is when people have an image or, or a phrase about a Muppet or a puppet character and say voiced by. Ah. Uh. That. <laughs> my teeth crack. I <laughs> just knit my jaw so hard. Um, I That frustrates the crud out of me because <laughs> puppeteers give so much more than just the voice and being proficient or have been lucky enough to be allowed to get the opportunity to do both uh muppeteering's just puppeteering just that much harder so mm -hmm. not voiced by <laughs> <laughs> i know there's like very few instances or maybe like a legacy character like i know big bird was sometimes voiced by carol spinney like even after he stopped performing as Big Bird, but in most cases, it's like it's everything for most puppeteers. Now there are obviously there's some examples of shows where they're taking advantage of 
very talented voice performers and the puppeteers are either manipulating to a pre-recorded track as I have done. So like, for instance, when I was part of the Book of Pooh and I was manipulating the puppet of Tigger, or at least um, the the core performer with uh, two and sometimes three uh, additional performers helping me out with the full body, we were performing to Jim Cummings' track. So oh. absolutely, the character is voiced by Jim Cummings. And in that instance, you know, you can totally delineate puppeteered by whatever. But w- when it is fully encapsulated and when it's not the dark crystal and someone's voice is being replaced, um, performed by is my preferred. Um, puppeteered by is fine. But <laughs> then even on, you know, the dark crystal was a half and half. Like, for instance, you know, Victor Yared was was lucky enough that his voice was captured for particular character Alice Deneen was lucky enough to have her Skeksy I believe character she her voice was part of the final performance but then they also performed other characters that were voiced by by other voice actors and talented in their own right uh either I think with their with that show that with their voices were replaced they recorded scratch track on set and their voices were replaced ah then I've experienced that as well but Again, it's more to do with when you're looking at the the image of a classic Muppet character or a classic Sesame Street character, and for the most part, when it says only voiced by that 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 bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, diving back a little bit into uh, anime and Pokemon and stuff like that, uh, I know that one of your pseudonyms is uh, HD Quinn. I, I find it interesting with voice actors because. Voice actors are some of the only people you can speak to and you can say, all right, Mr. So-and-so, and then you can follow it up with, if that is your real name. But uh, <laughs> where does where does your pseudonym H.D. Quinn come from, if there is a story behind it at all? There is, actually. It's um, the name of a character I played in a theater piece, a, a play that was written uh, about the sort of struggle that ranchers and the individuals who raised cattle with um, the government-owned lands that were being leased to those professionals for those endeavors. So I I played a cattle rancher named H.D. Quinn who had made an agreement with the government to lease lands for his cattle about the same time that I was first asked to do a thing where my name wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to be used. One of the things that happens when... You're um, a performer who becomes known in a certain entity. You you want to make sure you protect the projects with which your name is associated, and not necessarily allow project other projects to utilize the name that would be otherwise associated. So I can't. I believe the first thing I had to use H D Quinn for was a short film because in the process of negotiating for a union contract. Uh, the student film couldn't ever figure it out and I didn't want to leave them in the lurch. So I was like, well, we'll just use this name. And because it was already out in the ether, the next couple of times that it wasn't appropriate to use the name Tyler Bunch, I pulled that one out. Mm-hmm. And what are the initials for HD? If there were, um, you know, I would have to go and look up the play. I honestly don't remember. <laughs> I only remember him as HD. <laughs> well, for now, we'll just call him high definition. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I also, I had a thing here. Like, I also wanted to show you this. Uh, this VHS tape that I had uh, talking more about Henson stuff. Uh, the best of, I don't know if you can see it, but it's the best of Kermit on Sesame Street from like 1998. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you were in there as like a little, I think one of the uh, three little pigs or something. And but right. do you remember that? What's Yes, actually, I absolutely do. Um, mainly because it was one of, and, and I've done a lot of projects, so I wouldn't necessarily be able to say, oh yeah, I remember that from a lot of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. But I remember a specific moment because... There's a thing that happens with monitor puppetry, especially with multi-camera monitor puppetry, that you go through a rehearsal where we've got our hands over our heads and we're looking down at a television screen that shows us the image that we're seeing so we can properly manipulate the puppets within the frame. When they switch between cameras and the angle changes, 
we have to slightly adjust our performance so that it looks right for each angle as it's being captured. Mm -hmm. And when we rehearse something and they show us where the camera angles are going to cut so we can make our little minor adjustments. And then we finish the rehearsal and everybody's doing their, what they call last looks where they're either adjusting things on the set or they're making sure the puppets look good or they're putting, you know, last touches on human performers who need their makeup and hair done. It's been a minute since the rehearsal, so when we lift <laughs> our puppets over our head, we ask for a reference, meaning a reference shot, meaning you cut through the cameras, show camera one, show camera two, show camera three, so we can make sure that we've put ourselves back in the right position and are all set to go. Yeah. That was a big explainer for the fact that <laughs> I hadn't been on set a lot, and um, somebody shouted out, pig reference, for us to hold our pigs over our heads. Mm -hmm. And so I said, Charlotte's Web, <laughs> meaning, you know, a reference yeah, yeah. for a pig. <laughs> and I saw Frank Oz's eyebrows go up. And he's like, oh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> Animal Farm. And then we went back and forth for a little while with pig references. And the reason I remembered is because it was the first time I could kind of tell I made Frank Oz laugh. Wow. And so that particular <laughs> moment has stuck in my head for a long time. You got the pigs, the pigs, the pigs! Shh! Why are you here, Pickies? Well, because we are close personal friends of Kermit the Frog. Mm -hmm. He talked to us twice on Sesame Street News. Exclusive! <laughs> we will bring in the prize. Yes, the prestigious new Froggy Award! The, the biggest prize a frog can get! <laughs> Ed. We'll do anything else we want. You to. betcha. <laughs> <laughs> this could be trouble. That's crazy. I didn't think I was going to get something like that from Sean. <laughs> I know, <day>. right? <laughs> but that's awesome. That's great. <laughs> I mean, with all due respect to Frank Oz, I mean, all the interviews I've seen, he, he, he's always like, meh, eh, eh. but that, that, that's pretty, that's pretty good. You, <laughs> you made Frank Oz laugh. <laughs> yeah, it was a feel good. It was a, obviously a really big deal for a, you know, I, th I guess I was either 27 or 28 at the time. So, yeah, that was a feel good. <laughs> look, look, look at what I'm doing. I, I'm 27. What am I doing with my... <laughs> my... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, yeah, just thinking about how you've been... Because, I mean, I've already gone on about, like, how you were in all this stuff. All, in my formative years, you were already in, like... Sesame Street, Bear in the Big Blue House. But it's a weird kind of feeling thinking about that. It's not like other voice actors where it's like, oh yeah, he was in this other thing and he was in this other cartoon. It's like, no, this guy was already in this part of my life and I didn't know about that until years later. It's like you're infiltrating like different parts of my brain where it's like, that, <laughs> these two, there's no way this guy is like doubling as this Pokemon that I, one of my favorite Pokemon of all time as of like last year. And he was doing stuff <laughs> like 20 odd years back as this character that I really got attached to. There's no way. It was, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I've, I've been very, it's a double-edged sword in that um, I've been lucky enough to do a lot of projects and work with a lot of really famous people. But when it's not you on screen, the, you know, the commodity that is the artist, when you, when, an actor becomes a brand and someone's hired them because they are the brand. It's a little easier to um, negotiate, if you will, uh, a little bit bigger paychecks or whatever the case may be. For a yeah. lot of us, we're just happy to get the work. And um, I was screwing around on, on Twitter a few weeks ago before I pulled back and saw some famous person had had somebody comment wow, you've got like 156 credits on IMDb. And I was like, <laughs> oh, weird. And I went and looked myself up. And I was like, hey, we're twinsies. Actually, I got 157. Ha ha ha. <laughs> the famous person did like the tweet, but at the same time, it, it's one of those things of like, I have been very fortunate. I've had a lot of good opportunities and I've probably been on just about anybody I meet who's anywhere 10 to 15 youngers, years younger or even more younger than me, um, I've probably been in front of their face or in their life in some way, shape, or form over their formative years. Mm -hmm. um, and they'd never know it. They just, yeah. they'd never, ever know it. 
Like I tell my friends all the time when we're playing stuff or watching Pokemon, it's like, hey, that guy, you, you probably heard him in Bear in the Big Blue House. And they're like, no, no, you, you're, you're, you're lying to me. <laughs> so, no, I don't lie. <laughs> so more Pokemon questions, because this, when this comes out, this comes out for a thing called Pokemon. So I like to try and uh, sprinkle in some Pokemon questions and make it somewhat tie into the thing. Sometimes I have problems doing that, but it's whatever. This is fun. But, uh... When it comes to Pokemon, because you've been on Pokemon since, I think, since like 2012 or so, which is insane. But uh, what are some of your favorite humans and creatures you've voiced? And do you have a favorite Pokemon overall? Um, that is such a great question. I think I had a lot of fun um, being the, the English dub for uh, Lysander, who was the bad guy for Ooh. a full season. Mm -hmm. uh, just because... You know, it's fun to play the bad guy, but also um, he got to do a lot of really fun, manipulative stuff. And, and it's not a thing that I typically get to do when I'm performing puppet characters. So being yeah. a bad guy is fun. The unlimited greed of humans has sent the world spinning into chaos. Have you not felt that? If I had not raised my objections, the world would continue on its warped path. But now you choose to appear. What could possibly be left to defend? You have no right! I have placed my hopes in humanity. They have always protected me. Now it is my turn. I will incinerate you! And I really enjoy the challenge of what we're asked to do with the English dub for the characters of uh, involving the syllables of the character's name and figuring out with the creature characters how to make those syllables feel like there's emotional dynamics and that, that it always kind of makes sense that they would only use those sounds. Yeah. So all of them are fun. But uh, Incineroar, simply because of the fact that he's gotten to do so much and get to be in you know the video game world and things like that, and I was fortunate enough to be asked to, to voice that incarnation of him as well. Yeah. In the Smash Brothers game. And uh, people really seem to enjoy... I get more comments about that character. But oh, yeah. I think my favorite is actually Halucha. Just because mm -hmm. I think halucha has got... He's got a lot of cool attitude. And he's he's fun to perform. Use my jump kick! Kick was right on target. I love Halucha. Halucha and Incineroar are like some of my most favorite Pokemon as of the more recent years. I say recent, but Halucha was introduced in like 2013, so like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but yeah, Incineroar, because when it comes to Smash Brothers, I've always noticed that when it comes to like the Pokemon characters, they always take it from like the English dub. And they're very consistent with that. So when I saw Incineroar, I was like, they're probably going to get HD Quinn to play this guy. And uh, yeah, I, I, lo and behold, I was right. And yeah, you weren't wrong. Like, when it comes to Smash Brothers, that is like the kingmaker for a lot of characters that get in the game. No matter who you are, all eyes are on you if you're like a playable character. And like, you just look at the comments of like the voice clips. It's like, dude, this guy's having way too much fun playing Incineroar. <laughs> <laughs> and like all my friends and family members, if they play Incineroar, they've all memorized like his little isms and little voice clips and things like that. Incineroar, it, it, it's a big reason why Incineroar is uh, one of my favorite characters in that game as well. Not just in the regular Pokemon anime or the Pokemon games, but he's one of my most favorite characters in that. And it's just because of his personality and what you brought to the character. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Kind of you to say. Yeah. Do you remember? So it was just like when it came to the uh, audition or was it really just an audition or did someone pull you aside and say, hey, you want to be in this game real quick? <laughs> With that one, I'm I'm fairly confident Incineroar was uh, one of the characters Lisa Ortiz asked me to try out. And she specifically asked me to do this growly thing, I believe. If, mm -hmm. if I remember it correctly, T Tom Wayland asked me to do Halucha. And Lisa asked me to do Incineroar. So it was less that I was asked to do it for the game. It was just one of those things of like, well, let's just ask that when it 
happen. Let's just ask the guy who does the English dub if, if he'd be interested. So I didn't have to audition for the game. I was literally just asked if I would do it. So that was kind of cool. Makes sense to me. My, my theory is correct then. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, X and Y with Lysander, that was, that was fantastic. If you ask most fans, people will say X and Y was a great time for the show. But uh, I'd have to say that the next series, Sun and Moon, was also like maybe the best that the show has ever been. And uh, I have this little Blu-ray of the Power of Us movie, if you can see it nice. okay. And you were okay. you you did like double time in a, a lot of Pokemon in there. And uh, I'm I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to uh, various Pokemon voices. Like when it comes to Pokemon that have uh, historically kept their Japanese voices, I can usually be like, wait a minute. Wait, that's an English voice. Why why did they change that after all this time? But with some of your Pokemon that you did, like you did Tyranitar, I know that one, uh, Lugia, and a couple of other ones, I couldn't tell. And then when I saw, I was like, oh, oh, that's pretty good. I that's I I couldn't even tell the difference. <laughs> yeah, know? what's 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 fun whenever we're asked to to um partake if you will in a in a character that already has uh existed in uh the the original form and either we're the first to tackle the english dub version or um for whatever reason the uh original performers are are either you know no longer with us or um need to be replaced for whatever reason um they typically go back to the original japanese reference and play us that and the goal most of the time is to get as close to the original Japanese as possible, or at least the original Japanese tonal intent, and just layer on the English syllables. And uh, I try whenever possible to pay as much deference to those uh, original performances because, number one, you know, that's what inspired the original animation so of course that is technically yeah. the character and we're simply another version of it but also most of the world consumes pokemon in other languages like, yeah the english is one of the smallest uh audiences for the franchise at large so it just makes sense to try and be as close to that or original source material as possible those those folks are really the characters we're just a version yeah and it's actually because most of the dubs uh, outside of Asia are based on the English dub. And it's funny because they will keep, like for, I know that there are some uh, regions that keep the English names for uh, certain Pokemon. And, it, and that ties back to a whole thing where like, I know that uh, when the games were first localized in like Spain and maybe Germany, maybe not Germany, it's just a couple of other countries, they just didn't have the budget to translate some Pokemon names, and that's just a relic that's stuck for forever. So you might hear a Brazilian dub, and you could hear Incineroar's English voice if its name is Incineroar there. So there are a lot of people in various countries who hear your voice as the Pokemon, so that's also kind of cool. It is. I think. It's, it's fun. It's fun <laughs> to be, you know, to know that that many people are enjoying your performance is nice. Yeah, even if they don't know who, who this person is or if they don't look it up. It's like, no, I, 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 I'm still with them. <laughs> so when it comes to, because you, you've already said you voiced a lot of, like you voice a lot of big creatures in Pokemon, like Incineroar, Tyranitar, but uh, which one, do you, is there any one that you dread the most or which is the one that makes you say, ah, this one is easy on the pipes. I love this one. <laughs> um, Again, I, I would have to come back to Halucha just because he's so much fun. Mm -hmm. And um, th they, uh, man, that's a good question. I have to think about that for a second. <laughs> Take I your think time. The one that sort of requires the least amount of performative energy because I have to basically eat the microphone is Goler. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause he's just Goler. like, he's just little, so uh, down here. So, Ooh. <laughs> um, and I think they even, they even manipulate a little bit and put the echo on it. So yeah, he's, he's the one that's quote unquote, 
quote unquote the easiest, if you will. Um, but still, there's always that challenge of within just those two syllables giving as much emotional performative um, due to to honor the the imagery and like I said, the the original performances. Um, mm -hmm. It's always they're all fun. They're all fun to do. Yeah. I even think, uh, going back to Sun and Moon again, uh, you, you voiced a couple of human characters in there. Like, uh, there was a DJ guy, if you remember him, and I, could, I couldn't even tell that was you. That was like... Hey, no one's more surprised than I am. That Doug Trio changed my whole life. I was trying to make it singing songs of gratitude to Alola, but it wasn't long before I found I had strayed from my original path to success to my dream. That was really good, and, uh... There was also Viren. He was like the dude who was like a millionaire kind of guy who was trying to expand his uh, brand and stuff. Oh yeah, the big the big jerk guy. Yeah. 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 You you kind of got a shirt like him actually. I do. Right yeah. I'm you wearing, I'm wearing like his him. style right now. <laughs> <laughs> Shave my head a little bit more. Well, full over Yeah. And I do mean that in the best possible way. You you you, you sure, look of like course, you, of you could cosplay him if you wanted to. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So, you're the one in charge here? That's right, I'm the owner, and my name is Rango. I see, well, Byron is my name, and I'm the president of Rainbow Happy Resort. I'm gonna get straight to the point. I like this place, and I'm gonna buy it off of you. Aren't you acting a little rash? Even a rundown place like this can be a relaxing break for city people. So I'll build a resort hotel here and make some money. You get a little for selling it. That's what I call a win-win situation. Everybody's happy. Uh, not interested. When it comes to, uh, I know you've also done a little bit of adaptation work, and I've spoken to a couple other actors in the past who have dabbled in adaptation, but uh, when you come about it, how does your process differ from others if there's anything to note? And any specific examples of what you had to do for localizing? It's such an isolated world and that, you know, you're kind of doing things on your own. So I don't know how my method compares and contrasted to anybody else because I've never really watched anyone else or been part of anyone else doing it. Yeah. Um, I think I'm too much of a perfectionist because I really want to create syllabic content on the page that matches whatever's going on phonemically on the screen. So when, when the mouths are making specific shapes, I'm going overboard to try and make sure that I'm writing things that look like they fit. Yeah. And I think it means that my hourly wage goes way, way down because I spend so much time trying to make it interesting, trying to make it funny, <laughs> and also trying to make it look like it matches. And I don't, uh, I've enjoyed and it's a challenge and I'm hats off to the people that do it well, all deference. Um, cause it is, it is a, a, very difficult job and it not only does it take uh technical ability uh it takes a lot of talent to do that well i'm not uh i'm not ashamed of the stuff that i've done but i, I know there are people who are better at that job than i am <laughs> that's all right <laughs> the the thing i remember doing the most for was uh snack world which uh, yeah in that show, they tried at one point to do two different versions. So there was a a kid-friendly version and one that was really geared toward adult sensibility and adult humor. And because they weren't sure which way it was going to play in English, what whether they were going to get the older anime fans into it or whether it was going to be an actual kid show like it was intended to be. Um, so that was also another challenge of figuring out how to sort of write similar jokes and thoughts over and above the storyline content that that worked in both of those worlds uh, was was that was hard. I can imagine that's really inch. I I never thought they'd try something like that with a uh, snack world, but interesting. <laughs> All right, now we're getting like full on into the Muppetry questions from from here on out. But uh, yeah, uh, real quick, uh, did you ever get the chance to meet Jim Henson? I'm just just throwing that out there just to see. Unfortunately, no. I actually started puppeteering um, shortly after he passed. So, uh, well, at least that you know, film and television television style puppetry. Um, 
So I never got the chance. I, I got to meet pretty much the rest of the known family members uh, over the course of the last couple of decades, but I never got to meet Jim. Hmm. Oh, well, can't be helped. But uh, let's see. What would What is your favorite Muppet production, both for something you've been a part of and maybe just as a fan? If the world at large still considers uh, Bear in the Big Blue House a Muppet production, that's always going to top my list because it was really a wonderful experience and a, a true familial connection with everyone on the cast and crew. I was lucky that it was my first major experience because few have risen to that sort of emotional connectivity level for me. Mm -hmm. um, as a fan, I really remember enjoying the original uh, Fraggle Rock uh, in the in the eighties, late eighties on on mm -hmm. HBO. It was it was really a lot of fun to watch, and the music was wonderful, and um, the themes and the characters were just really fun to watch. And if I'm honest, that's probably where my interest first got peaked as to figuring out how the art was being done. I wasn't necessarily full on interested in being a puppeteer yet, but I was at that point watching going, how is that happening? Where are the people? Where are they hiding? How is that working? Mm -hmm. um, so that one sticks out in my head as, as fond memories. Nice. Uh, what was it? Uh, have you heard of, I'm, I'm sure you have, but have you heard of the show uh, Dog City from Jim Henson? Yes. Yes. Ah. Yeah, I've I've just recently been watching that for the first time, and I love it. it. It's so great, but not a lot of people talk about it. But it's got some good there's stuff. There's some really in good there. puppetry in it too. Yeah, there's some strong stuff that um, I wish it had gotten more of a shot because uh, yeah. I, I imagine it could have done some really neat stuff. Yeah, me too. Because I, I I liked it so much that I'm currently like making a video about it. And uh, yeah, it was also partially done in Canada and. Long story short, I have a friend who's been a friend of mine for since high school, and he, his dad has been in the animation industry, and then I find out that his dad is best friends with the director of the show, so I'm going to try and see if I can get, like, any information about, like, why was this the way this was, or what happened here, what was coordination like, but, uh, yeah, I'm hoping I can get something out of that, because, yeah, I feel like more Good people luck. should talk about Dog City. More power to you. I hope it works. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> So, what are some of your favorite moments working with uh, Muppets or Sesame Workshop? Because I know you've been in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade a few times, and even as a Canadian who celebrates Thanksgiving a month prior, I, I still realize that as a, it was a huge moment for anybody to be part of. Uh, it's one of those things that I kind of, the Macy's Parade is, uh, I plan my holiday around it. Like, I haven't been... A lot of other places so that I could <laughs> do the parade for, for a couple of decades now. But um, I think in terms of the coolest opportunity I got, and I, I don't know if you could necessarily call this a Muppet thing, but the Jim Henson Company designed and built a character for an ad campaign for Air New Zealand. Um, hmm. The character's name was Rico. And it was an effort to advertise some uh, design elements of their planes as they were expanding their fleet to absorb a lot of the tourist traffic that was coming to New Zealand because of the popularity of the Lord of the Rings movies. And although not connected to the movies at all, um, the, uh, the traffic that they were getting and so many more people of different um, financial ability uh, was creating this need to design new seats that could accommodate different price ranges. And mm -hmm. they came up with this weird idea to have this strange creature, who animal, obviously, of, you know, of the earth, of nature. Like, you can't tell whether he's a raccoon or, or a possum or a cat or whatever he is. He's just got all weird parts that just likes to fly on airplanes and prefers to fly on Air New Zealand. And so I did an <laughs> ad, camp ad campaign for them for a year. I went to New Zealand twice, over a year, actually. I went to New Zealand twice, California a bunch of times. Uh, I got to shoot a scenes with uh, David Hasselhoff, and I <laughs> did a, a scene with Lindsay Lohan while she was in house arrest, under house arrest in her house. Uh, <laughs> I wrote and performed a rap with Snoop Dogg. 
um, I got to do all these really cool things because of that character. So that one is probably tops on my list for, for cool stuff I got to do. Yo, Rico, what it do? It's your big cousin Snoop Dogg from the Wild Wild West, man. Greetings. And I cooked you up this banging track. How we are today? Let me see if you can spit some too. Ready to get some fur on? Come on. Ladies, Rico's here just off the plane. Ready to take away all your pain. We're gonna cook a dish made to savor. Come out your spice, don't matter the flavor. Where's my lady sack tonight? Where my baby's at tonight? Where's my sunshine? Would you be mine? Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. I'm freaking out over here, man. That's that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it was a good time. I can imagine. Uh, but yeah, speaking of like Henson, like Henson adjacent stuff, like I know you said, I'd say Bear in the Big Blue House. It's got the Henson name at the end. Even, I'll even say Between the Lions is as close to Henson as you can get. I know that's not Henson, but it's Henson adjacent. Oh, and if there are some people who would be mad at you for saying that. Ooh. <laughs> I, the puppets I were know, designed and built by Three Design um, in, in cooperation with with uh the the producers of that show um a company called serious thinking in in tandem with um uh wgbh mm-hmm. although a lot of those folks did obviously have a certain amount of notoriety and maybe even some teeth cutting with endeavors that involved the jim henson company i don't think any of them would necessarily be happy if it was considered quote unquote Henson adjacent. Oh. So maybe we maybe we keep that one to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, but Big Bird, Ernie and Bert showed up and I remember when I was like six years old they showed up. It's like that that's good enough for me. That's legit. Yeah, right. It's legit. It starts. <laughs> and we also all, you know, there was the the We Are Family fundraiser thing that Nile Rogers Foundation did, which involved a lot of the kids' properties, because Between the Lions, it was Sesame Street, Bear was there, Barney was there. So there was a whole, look that up, kids. We are family, <laughs> fundraiser, whatever the heck. So you are right. The worlds do rub up against each other. but Yeah, and that's good enough confident. for me. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, you know, I just need to make sure I get my technicality straight. I look this up on Wikipedia <laughs> and all this other things. And it's like, I even, I, I search Henson, Henson, Henson technically it's it's good enough it's got people from that place and it's perfect i say it's hence <laughs> <laughs> but uh let's because yeah between the lines was another big thing for me and like if i say the word cliffhanger my mom just starts going can't hold on much longer if you remember cliffhanger nice. <laughs> oh of course i do now i could have misread it but i'm fairly confident Chris, who voiced Cliff, you know, I was the narrator for Cliffhanger. Oh, really? We find Cliffhanger where we left him last, hanging from a cliff. Can't hold on much longer. Deftly, Cliff delves into his backpack and extracts his trusty survival manual. Using his expert decoding skills, Cliff begins to read. <laughs> um, but Chris, who, who voiced Cliffhanger himself, He's he's the new Optimus Prime in the new movie. No I'm kidding. Confident. Uh, who's this? I'm looking it up right now. Chris, uh, might I ask for the surname? I want to say Helmsworth. Chris, I'm, I'm gonna brain fart. I could be wrong. I could be conflating. It says Chris Hemsworth to voice Optimus uh, Prime in the new Transformers. I'd be like, I how did guess he? Get... I'm wrong. That's okay. <laughs> Cliffhanger is good enough. I was so wrong. That's Johnny okay. Johnny McWrong. You'll edit that out. That's yeah, 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 sure. No, I'm I'm gonna leave this in. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was a song from Bear in the Big Blue House that you uh, had a hand in. You you had a hand in several of those songs. I, I just looked it up on the Muppet Wiki, but uh sure. do you remember the song uh Otter Love from Of course I do. Sometimes when you're working more hard at play, there's a feeling that you get that won't go away. It's a warm glow down deep inside. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, mm. I knew. So basically what happened, my, my progression as a lyricist on Bear in the Big Blue House was um, they were teaching Tutter how to dance. And uh, the exec producer was not feeling really excited about what had come out of uh, some of the efforts that had happened. And he was just like, well, let's open up to whatever. And he basically turned to Peter Linz and I and said, you guys, you always are doing fun stuff on the set. Why don't you guys just make something up and see? we'll see what happens. Maybe we use it. Maybe we don't. And Peter kind of looked at me. He's like, oh, should we do that? I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll write something tonight at home. We'll figure it out. And so I brought in uh, a version uh, and Peter and I went into the dressing room and he said, it'd be fun if we, if we did kind of a, you know, Beastie Boys thing where, where every once in a while we just <laughs> shout words together and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's kind of funny. Why not? Let's do that. And so we auditioned it for um, the crew and everybody on the set just performed it with a, ba- with a basic beat. And ultimately that wound up being the final thing it was what what i wrote and peter sort of tweaked with me and then from then on whenever um there needed to be a a rap or or sort of a a pop music feeling thing for the otters i, I would get asked to write it so i wrote all of the lyrics for uh otter love and a, f- a few other ones so that was the the t- tutter dance i can't even remember the the Otter Dance, that's right. Otter Dance, um, Otter Love. Um, there was a rhythm song that we did um, together and with Bear. But basically, anytime the otters rapped, I wrote the lyrics. Nice. Because, I, I, yeah, I, I had to listen to Otter Love again. It, it had probably been quite a while since I last heard heard of it. And uh, I'm sorry to say that, but I, I, I did good. And I listened to it last night and I was like, this is really legit. And if, if you just heard this like on the radio or something and you didn't have any connection to Bear in the Big Blue House, it it might just pass as just like a legit like <laughs> Beastie Boys, R&B-esque sounding song. And even the lyrics are a little like, wait a minute, did he just say something like... <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Taken there's out some of context. little double entendres. I was like, yeah, let's there's just, some fun ones, this. yeah. Yeah, some, I remember there was a lyric about, like, let's all get high or something. They were talking about, you know, like, on love and stuff like that. A high feeling. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, and there's a, there's even one, there's a, a a phrase that got cut out that I originally wrote. Um, no kidding. That uh, basically, at the time, the producers in general felt that it bordered on the insinuation of uh, same-gender affection too much. I see. Oh, the the basic lyric was, but that affection from Pip, but that attention from Pop, it's causing some confusion that we don't know how to stop. (laughs) The the play on words was, (laughs) we've learned so much about love, we can't figure out which one is the best, because the next phrase is, with all the many different kinds of love out there, we just can't decide on our favorite. Mm-hmm. So it was a lead in to the love that he's experiencing for all of these things and the love that I'm experiencing for all these things. There's so much love, we can't figure out the favorite. And the, you know, Bear's response is it's not one kind of love you're dreaming of. The otters gasp, oh, that's it. We love love. Just we love to love in general. It doesn't have to be about a specific kind of love. Yeah. And uh, nowadays, it's quite possible the lyric would totally fly. Yeah. <laughs> but back then, they were like, no, 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 that's too much. You got to cut that one. <laughs> oh, well. Now, whether it's for bears or lemurs or mice, Audrey loves the best because you're getting it twice. But with all the many different kinds of love out there, we just can't decide on our favorite bear. It's not one kind of love you're dreaming of. Oh, that's it. We love love. Now we know that I didn't think all these questions. I just half of these questions I just came up with last night and I'm getting all these interesting answers that I thought maybe you'd be like, I don't remember that. Or maybe I kind of do, but I'm glad you remember Otter Love because that's a legit song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that one's that one's stuck in my head. And um, Peter Lurie is just fantastic musical director who really did a fantastic job on Bear of making sure that the the whole 
musical feel was never patronizing and 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 was always kind of um rich and inspiring in general and that each episode kind of had its own musical vocabulary um and that, that was again very rich he partnered uh me with that song with his his um sort of oversight uh, a guy named uh, Tony Fennell who who basically wrote the the music for the chorus mm-hmm. um but again most most of the the words were were all me which was cool that's great yeah i love when i love when like children shows or have like legit musical albums like the show dinosaurs uh pokemon had quite a few in its earlier days where they did not, let's not make a kid's bop version. Let's make this legit. Let's get people who know what they're talking about. Let's make some fun lyrics. And I just throw them on whenever. And it's just as legit as anything else. And that's what I love about what you guys do. And it inspires me to, because I've gotten into a little bit of uh, songwriting just as a hobby. Like I'll take a song from, let's say, the Japanese version of Pokemon and try to adapt it in a way that feels to, like in the spirit of the original maybe not word for word like a direct translation but something that sounds like something that we would say over here but yeah right. just to see that you guys just dabble in all that stuff it's like oh that's cool that's inspiring that they, they do all these things and it's just it's just fun for them so yeah that's great but uh i also know that you worked with uh peter Linz on uh let's see there was a uh, it goes by a bajillion different names, but there was Go Go Ricky. You know, you know that uh, series, or there was oh, like the... a couple movies, the little animals that are like shaped like little th- circles. Oh, oh yeah. What do I know? I know it as uh... Kiko Ricky. Kiko Ricky. That's what I. Yeah, yeah. Kiko Ricky is what I remember it as. Yeah. 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 I, I went back and forth with with another, depending on which outing, with another uh, <laughs> performer for that, and some, sometimes I was voicing. The penguin. Sometimes I, uh, I, I, I was the the moose. Doc, Doco, Doco, Doco. Doco. Yeah, you, you're the second person. You're the and second Doco Kingu. I've spoken to actually, because like I've spoken to uh, David Wills, if you know him, and uh, mm-hmm. he was Doco in the original Four Kids version when it was called Go Go Ricky. At last, a miracle of modern technology, the wonderful improviser. This is where you applaud madly. And it's, I, right. I just find that so interesting how it's done by the same group of people, not the same studio, of course, but like right. some people are still the, these characters and like a couple right. guys are these characters now. It's like, that's so interesting and mind boggling. But did you get like, yeah. did you like drag Peter Linz onto that or something? Basically, yes. <laughs> that's how I figured uh, it worked. Again, Tom Whalen asked uh, if, if, if Peter would be interested and I... I kind of forced him. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's just another, you know, feather in the cap. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Could be worse things to be on, and I think Go Go Riki or Riki, what whatever it's called now, is pretty cool. I also have a note here that just says you also played a DJ in Nature Cat and Pokemon, which I just think is pretty funny. I, I, <laughs> That's all. <laughs> if you recall uh, the character in Nature Cat, I, I, I've never seen Nature Cat, but. I just know I, I'm I'm just one of those guys that looks into all these things and it's like oh this was done here this was done here oh this guy's in this thing but yeah well if, if you didn't um, Nature Cat is uh, produced by the Spiffy Pictures which is David Rudman's company who now plays oh you know um, Cookie Monster and uh, um, Janice um, Muppets Mayhem um, so. He he asked if I would. I can't remember whether it was I auditioned for the first thing that I did for Nature Cat, or I've, t- I've played two characters on it now, <clears throat> or just went and recorded it, and he showed it to the producers. I can't remember which mm-hmm. it was, or distributors. I can't remember which it was, but but yeah, that was that's fun. Animation's fun. It just is. Yeah, I think we're getting near the end now. Uh, but uh, let's see. Last couple of questions. Uh, uh, what is something that you've been in? That you feel deserves more eyes on it, like an underrated role or something. Hmm, that is a good question. Uh, well, I wish, I wish the Tick, the the latest version of the Tick on Amazon Prime would have gotten, um, some more seasons. I I thought it was really funny. Um, 
it's a live action show. If you guys didn't see it, um, Ben Edlund, who originally created the tick was also, you know, the head of this particular endeavor a couple of years ago. I played a human character on it and I just think it was really funny and really well done. I wish it would have had a little bit longer run, but again, that was a, what I call a fleshy role. I separate my voice acting <laughs> and my puppeteering and I call my, my human acting roles, my fleshy roles. Um, <laughs> they done. A guy who owned and ran a gym in that named Stash. That was fun. Yeah, I, I hear good. Th I remember watching uh, the animated Tick when probably when I was a little bit too young to watch it, but it was still generally family friendly. But yeah, maybe I need to get back into the Tick. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, why not? I I'm sure I would. Another quick between the lions uh, thing. Uh, I remember the pigeons vividly, but you only played, uh, there was one character called Walter, and I think you only played him in the first season, if you can recall. Um, That's a good question. I can't remember whether it was just seasons one. It may have been seasons one and two. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you know, before the, um, when the serious thinking folks in WGH were trying really hard to keep that show alive, uh, it kept getting smaller, um, and they they were doing more in in um, in a tighter space with with uh, a very compact crew of folks, and eventually even moved it down south, uh, where a company was offering them use of their studio effectively for free to keep shooting the show. So they couldn't really take all of us down. Um, yeah, and. Jim Krupa took over the character for a while. Again, I, I still wound up being involved as a voice actor for some of the animated pieces, but yeah, I didn't puppeteer as much after those first two seasons. Interesting. Yeah, when I looked up, because, uh, I mean, I didn't keep tabs on Between the Lines after I got a little older, but I was surprised to see that it lasted up until, like, 2010. I was like, really? Wow, these guys. And I had to look up, like, the final cliffhanger just to see what happened, and I think I think it got stuck on the cliff again. I, I, I'll have to see it again just to make sure. But. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> now, is there some? Now you have done a lot in your career, but is there something that you haven't done yet that would make you go like, dude, that would be so cool if I got to do that? I'm still, you know, hoping for some more interesting opportunities and challenges as as a film actor, as a fleshy. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm also starting to do a little more directing. Um, and it's not, it's funny cause you always hear actors who, you know, I, I would really like to direct It's <laughs> yeah, less yeah. about being in control and more about the notion that when you're a performer in other walks you're you're a, a tool in the toolkit you're you're a toy in somebody else's sandbox you, you you're you get to bring in your own ore but it's always a piece of a bigger thing the the notion of being the one who's kind of doing the creative problem solving of wrangling all of that creativity into a a, a singular goal set a, a unified vision it's a different kind of creative challenge and it's very interesting. It's exhausting. A lot more exhausting than most people realize, I think. <laughs> uh, especially if you want to be respectful of all of the other artists who are coming in to participate and bring their best and utilize what they they bring to its best extent. And that kind of challenge has become more interesting for me. So I'm looking for more opportunities to to be part of the machine in that way. Cool. Well, I, I wish you luck on that, because, yeah, I, I think you could do it. I've only been speaking to you for like an hour, but I, I can already tell you can do it. You got this. I'm going to put that on my <laughs> resume. Are you cool? So cool if, yeah. if I put Malik says, I'm going to put it right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? I have a reputable YouTube channel. They can look me up. <laughs> I have references. <laughs> but uh, speaking of... Uh, any exciting projects coming up that you can talk about, whether it be in voice acting, Western animation, anime, puppetry, etc.? Uh, 
fleshy stuff. I've got a small role in the HBO Max series, um, the other two, uh, season three coming up. Um, you also might keep your eyes peeled um, for a very short blip of my face in some of the endeavors on HBO Max that will come out next year in the DC universe. Ooh. Um, which I can't say any more than that. Um, mm -hmm. but again, that's a that's a fleshy role. Um, I am directing a, a a kids property with a museum out of uh the Kansas City area, Overland Park. That's a uh, a steam based sh uh, curricular show uh, about Earth stewardship and and helping kids be more aware of of our surroundings and humans impact on our surroundings and so that one feels near and dear to my heart look for for club kikaboo it may be coming out in little spits and starts uh sometime soon and um just keep trugging along with uh the future seasons of sesame um we start shooting season 55 in january and of course season 54 will be coming out in the fall so keep your eyes peeled for that <laughs> That's wild, man. Uh, so let's see. Uh, here, here, a random question. Uh, what's your favorite pizza? I, I, I ask that uh, to for a couple of other actors, but uh, let's see what uh, if you're a pizza connoisseur. <laughs> I am uh, an everything kind of guy. I like a kaleidoscope on my pie. So like back when I lived in Louisiana, there was a franchise called Johnny's that used to call their everything pizza sweep the kitchen, which basically... <laughs> insinuated that everything from every pizza that had fallen on the floor just got swept up and dumped on this pie. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like lots of cheese and, and all the veggies and meats. Just throw it all on. Any uh, pizza place in uh, the New York area that you would say has the best pizza? Oh, man, that's 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 the kind of thing people get, like, you know, murdered or shot over. You got to be careful. Oh, of course. Um, I know. <laughs> <sighs> up here where I am in... in in Connecticut, there's a place called Fairfield Pizza that I really like their combo pizza. But if if I'm if I'm strolling around in Midtown, oh gosh, that's hard. There's a couple of places. <laughs> the hardest question today. Although, um, I'm gonna forget the name of it. Oh, please come. Uh, uh hold on. I'm gonna go. Yeah, yeah. Go you can for look some it up. Assistance. Yeah, yeah. There's a place. Um, thank you for your patience. And the glory of editing. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to leave this in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. This is the... Oh, sorry. Then, da, um, what's what's the proper elevator? Da, 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 da. I default to the Jeopardy, Final Jeopardy theme. Oh, do you? Yeah, for everything. Artichoke Basil. Artichoke Basil. That's the name of the place? Yeah. Artichoke Basil's Pizza. And their artichoke pizza is really freaking good. It sounds silly, but it's so good. Um, I'll have to give that a shot if I'm ever in the area. There's, there used to be one. It's basically down on 14th Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, 10th Avenue and 14th Street. Um, and one of the their their artichoke pizza. I'll just describe it to you: spinach and mm -hmm. cream sauce, artichoke hearts, mozzarella, and pecorino romano cheese. It's surprisingly amazing. But they also they don't back off on spices on their on their other pizzas and stuff, so it's it's got a lot of zest to it. But yeah, yeah, artichoke basil. Interesting. Yeah, because I'll I'll see if if I I I don't actually you know peruse the New York area, but if I'm ever down there <laughs> for whatever reason, I like to. It's like you know I speak to a lot of people in the New York area, so I should probably ask them what what the best pizza is, because you'll get like a bajillion different answers. And yeah, it's interesting to see because I mean I love pizza, so <laughs> there you go. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much covers everything. But is there anything that I didn't ask that you wanted me to ask? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, there was a very you know wide ranging topics, which was awesome. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't ask you any questions. What's your favorite pizza? Uh, let's see, cause uh, I'm boring, cause <laughs> I just get. <laughs> whatever is in my general area but uh, there was there was this really great place out in uh, Niagara Falls called Zappies it's it's actually it's still here but it's pretty good but i for 
that was the first time I had broccoli on pizza and it, it cost like two pizzas cost almost 80 bucks Canadian, but I say it was worth it. It was like, we can't do it every day, but right. it, that was some of the best pizza I ever had. <laughs> Alrighty. Good but, to know. Uh, yeah, but I guess, I guess you already asked me, but is there, is there like, uh, barring pizza questions, is there something that you wanted to ask me? Like, who are you? Why are you interested in what I do? <laughs> well, what 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 happens with your podcast? What are you what are you hoping to do with it? What 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 does this do for you in the world? Like, what is this just you know a hobby? Or are you trying to build it into something, or is it just for the fun of it? Uh, I guess it would be mostly a little bit of everything, honestly, because I like getting to speak with various people who I either grew up listening to or recently started hearing about and hearing their stories, getting a little bit of a spotlight on them if they really need it. I, I don't think you need a spotlight on you, but, you know, it'd be interesting to hear various people's stories. And, you know, as an up-and-coming voice actor myself, I, I like to I like to think I'm pretty decent. I haven't been in anything, really. I just do stuff on YouTube for the moment. I'm just waiting before I can, you know, maybe make... The dream is to make, like, a home studio and, you know, do what you guys get to do from the comfort of my own place or wherever that may be. But yeah, the, yeah, this whole podcast thing is just a, a little avenue to get to speak with these really inspiring people, shed a spotlight on them, and then just have a little hub where I get to say, hey, I got to speak with this guy. I'm, I'm a, or I'm acquainted with this dude. And uh, we, we talked about a bunch of weird stuff. So yeah. What's your, what's your favorite character that you've performed so far? Uh... Let's see. So, again, haven't been in anything professional, but uh, let's, as in, in terms of, I, I've done narration for various channels and things like that, and I've written a bunch of stuff and researched and things like that. But when it comes to characters that, let's say, let's see, because mm, I'm also like really into uh, creating, I'd like to make my own animated series one day or something like that. But I would say to make it easy, uh, I do a recurring thing for my YouTube channel where uh, I talk as like the character Meowth in Team Rocket from Pokemon, if that character oh, rings a bell. And of course. I do a lot of, uh, I, I take on the original version of Meowth, not uh, what Carter Cathcart has done with Meowth, even though I love his Meowth and everything that he's done with Pokemon and all that. But I go for the uh, the second voice of Meowth, Maddie Blaustein, and I try to channel... I try to channel what she did, and uh, something... He used to talk like this, and uh, it's like, oh, I'm gonna catch that Pikachu or something. But... Uh, I've done a lot of interesting things with that where I've taken songs from the Pokemon anime, uh, most of them actually written by Carter Cathcart, ironically enough, and I've expanded on them and I've taken things that he's done. Yeah, I, I've taken like little liberties from him and made full versions of songs that never got fully translated or songs that were completely in Japanese and I do them as like Team Rocket with uh, Meowth and uh, James as well. Like last year, uh, me and my friend, uh, we did a whole Team Rocket uh, duet. Uh, what's what's the third? What's the number three thing for that? Duet and then trio, I guess. Trio. Trio, trio, trio. <laughs> yes, we did a whole thing. And that was new for me because I hadn't done... Uh, I mean, I have sung a lot in the past and I've done previous song covers and translations before but this was the first time where i had to like direct somebody even if it was just for fun and she was in a different time zone than i was and we we made it work and th yeah this was the first she didn't know how to sing she, she didn't do a lot of singing so i tried to help her out with that and that was a lot of fun and the song itself that we were adapting it was really crazy because there was parts of dialogue in it there was a ballad, there was a solo, there was a little bit of rapping in there too. So I had to try and find a way to keep the tempo. Like I had to help her with singing and figuring out where she could hit those notes and adapting to uh, her strong suits. And then when it came to like the rapping stuff, I was like, okay, we got to stay in this beat. Like one, two, three, four. And that's kind of hard when you're like doing it over like Discord or Zoom or something. Of course. Yeah. But we made it work because I was doing things like, 
okay, I, I sent her like a scratch track of me doing it. So it's like, okay, here's what you have to do. You have to keep it into this beat. One, two, three, four. But uh, <laughs> we made it work and I was pretty happy with it. And I had to translate all the lyrics and tried to make it suit like an English speaking audience. But yeah, I would say my favorite role. That's just a long winded explanation to say that some of my favorite characters to perform are characters that have already are already be performed by other people. But Meowth, the little cat guy and James from Team Rocket, I like whenever I get the chance to make a song or translate a song and do something with them. I love playing those characters because they are so important to me as an actor and hearing like all the people who helped create them and stuff. They're so inspiring to me and I want to do I want to do good by the example that they have set with uh what they have done and you know, I mean, who knows? Maybe someday I could if someone ever came to me and said, "Do you want to play this character in an official capacity?" I would be like, "Where do I sign?" <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. That's that, that's that's not too not too crazy. That that's a pretty decent answer, right? That right? That's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I would argue that what you spoke the most passionately about was more the producing of things. So, yeah, keep keep your feelers out and eyes open for the notion that when someone's asking for an audio producer, that's something that you already seem to have an affinity for. Yeah, like it was scary. Like I didn't know how to mix audio at the time or anything, but I'm still learning bit by bit and. You know, I feel like I'm a triple threat when it comes to all this. I could have the potential to be a triple, quadruple, quintuple threat with writing, animation, uh, drawing, voiceover, audio stuff. I could dip my toes into whatever water I want if I really wanted to. But uh, yeah, that would be pretty much all the questions that I have. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say... Thanks so much. Well, thanks a bunch, actually. Uh, no pun. Well, pun partially intended. I'm sure you haven't heard that one before. <laughs> no, never. Wow. I, that's amazing that I got all the way through my life. No, I've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> you've heard You've heard it a bunch. <laughs> but uh, yeah, is there anywhere uh, people can follow you? I know Twitter is kind of a, a little bit of a dumpster fire, more so than it already is. But uh, right. Um, I, I need to get better about it. I'll probably start being a little more active on Twitter. So that's, uh, Tyler underscore bunch, um, on the Twitter, but, um, that's pretty much it. I mean, on, on Instagram, Instagram, (laughs) I'm going to start doing Instagram more on Instagram. I am Tyler underscore bunch. Yes. It's like, I'm off Twitter, but I'm going to get back on Twitter. No, no, no. That's not what I, (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, I just want to say for everybody watching at home, I just want to say thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, if, if, any, if you ever get the, if you ever crazy enough to want to speak to me again, you're more than welcome. It, it, you're always welcome. If you got new things like, hey, I think Malik would like to hear about this. <laughs> yeah, whenever, Will yeah, do, you're, you're always welcome on the show. And uh, yeah, I'll just say goodbye to the audience for now. So uh, thank you all for listening, I should say. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Goodbye, folks.